lush green fields, neatly trimmed hedgeways bordering rambling rose gardens, thatched roof stone cottages, picturesque old churches, a game of cricket on the village green, and a pint in the local pub. It's just another day in England's deadliest county, as Tom Barnaby and his current sidekick, Sergeant Gavin Troy, head off to investigate the latest murder to have occurred in this idyllic piece of English countryside. The British show Midsummer Murders has now run to over 100 feature-length episodes and has aired in approximately 200 countries and has one of the highest replay rates of any British TV show. Created by writer Carolyn Graham as the Chief Inspector Barnaby novels, the first five episodes of Midsummer Murders were adapted from Graham's novels and the episodes since have also attempted to stay true to Graham's theme and style, bringing unity of form and subject matter which helps to build the audience's engagement with the story and bring them back for more over the 17 series of shows produced so far. The episode that began it all was the pilot episode, first screened in 1997. Entitled The Killings at Badger's Drift, this episode was adapted from the award-winning novel with the same title. The novel itself has been named as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time by the Crime Writers Association, and Graham won several Best First Novel awards for the book following its publication in 1987. The Killings at Badger's Drift is our first introduction as viewers to Midsummer County. And in this introduction, nothing is kept back. We see Midsummer in full swing. All its usual activities are on display for us to be intrigued by. It begins with an elderly lady in the woods, searching for a rare orchid. In a grassy hollow behind the location of the orchid, she discovers more than she bargained for, in the form of a sexual liaison between two people who are unseen by the audience. Shocked, the woman cycles home, stopping only to glare at the driver of a Land Rover, in the middle of the village. When she arrives home, she rushes inside and makes a phone call failing to notice her neighbour, Iris Rainbird watching her through binoculars from the window turret attached to Mrs Rainbird's home. Meanwhile, back in the woods, we see a pair of legs from mid-calf down around and just walk around and discover the elderly lady's marking stick that she's left by the rear orchid. Hence, presumably, the mystery character now knows who was watching them. We suspect the person in the Land Rover. After all, they clearly are not happy with each other. However, this moment of eye contact turns out to be just another of the many red herrings thrown our way through the course of this chilling tale. The scene is set. Somehow the beautiful scenery and the unusual haunting tones of the intro music combine to make the activity on the screen decidedly suspicious. And so we wait for the inevitable moment when a death will be discovered. In this case, that moment comes when the elderly lady is discovered murdered, presumably we imagine for what she saw in the woods. Or what? Is that just another red herring? Throughout the history of Midsummer, Joyce Barnaby, the wife of the lead character Tom Barnaby, has on occasion tried to convince Tom to move to one of these picture postcard villages in Midsummer. Tom protests because of the frequent murder incidents he's constantly investigating and the oddness of the people he meets in the course of those investigations. Here in Badger's Drift, we see why Tom is so weary, as we are introduced to some of the strange villagers who intersperse the plot lines and country byways of this most watched of English counties. The characters of Iris Rainbird and her undertaker son Dennis just don't sit right with us, the viewer, or in fact their fellow villagers. The Rainbirds are very wealthy, in fact too wealthy, for undertakers in a small village. Dennis drives a personalised Porsche. They live in a very nice house with an exquisite windowed tower, or eerie, as the inspector refers to it, and they overcater to the extreme for minor events such as cups of tea with visitors, providing trays full of unusual foreign delicacies and various handmade sandwiches, painstakingly cut into decorative shapes. We find out, of course, that there is a perfectly perverse and very midsummer reason for the Rainbird's wealth. Iris' so-called bird-watching is actually, as we've already evidenced, people-watching in disguise. And together, the mother and son team keep detailed logs of the village's misdemeanours, which of course are never in short supply in any midsummer village, let alone in a den of iniquity like Badger's Drift. Every tryst, every harsh word, every minor accident or interaction with neighbours is catalogued meticulously, in case it can be used to blackmail some poor, unsuspecting fellow villager in the future. These sorts of characters are common in Midsummer. Never quite the same as each other, a raft of interesting characters with developing quirks or oddities that make them highly suspicious add to Barnaby's list of possible suspects, merely by being themselves. Interestingly, the Rainbirds are one of the very few characters in Midsummer to have doubles. 
who appear in another well-written and plot-related episode, which occurs several series in the future from the episode we are discussing now. Expanding on that though, would be spoiling the story, so we'd better not go there. These sorts of characters add to the strangeness of Midsummer County, which in turn adds to our interest as viewers in the story, making us wonder and look forward to finding out what strange character we're going to meet next. However, the real strangeness, as Schrader would describe it, of Midsummer Murders is the fact that within this beautiful English countryside, in this collection of Cape Town villages, occurs so many murders of such varied and brutal natures. As of January 2012, the kill rate was 2.6 people per episode for murders alone. Adding in deaths by accident and natural causes brings the death rate to 2.92 people per episode. This is a seriously dangerous place to be. Yet it's so attractive, the environment is almost calming in its on-screen presentation. This beauty and strangeness work together to give Midsummer Murders a very high repeatability attribute. People love to re-watch it, as the continued popularity of its TV reruns around the world show. I don't think it is the murders most people want to rewatch. It's elements such as the combination of the beautiful scenes, the interesting enigmatic characters, the detailed rural village settings, and the cleverly written plots. And of course, the way that Barnaby and his various sergeants approach the crimes and interact with the villagers involved in order to solve even the most complex and well-disguised of murders. There's also something appealing about the ongoing storyline that details Barnaby's family life, even though it is very minimal and we only catch small glimpses of it in each episode. We know it's there. Barnaby's a normal person with a normal life. He expertly investigates the abnormal, well, abnormal outside of Midsummer County, and finds immense enjoyment in the occasional visits of his growing up daughter Kelly, and in simply enjoying a pint with his sergeant and a solid meal in the canteen. This man falls asleep on the couch reading books like any working man, not to mention falling asleep at that crucial bedtime moment with his wife. So we feel like we know Barnaby, his wife and his daughter. We relate to them, and like a favourite soap opera, we look forward to watching the next episode, because we simply want to see what Barnaby is up to today. The British tradition of murder and crime mysteries is very strong, with multiple well-loved detectives working their way through countless cases, but Midsummer Murders connects with the popular audience in ways that others do not. Despite the popularity of Chief Inspector Morse, this life story is so much sadder than Barnaby's, and Agatha Christie's Poirot and Marple are just that little bit more complex, that little bit harder to relate to than Barnaby. And Frost, well, he's just downright depressing which is incredible in its own way, considering the same actor played the ir irrepressible Delvin. Somehow Midsummer Murders is brighter, more hopeful than all of these. It's somehow more akin to the American Columbo in its ability to inspire, and yet totally different. We probably don't know Barnaby as well as we know people like Columbo and Morse, yet we feel like we do. Maybe his character's just not that complex either way. His character doesn't get in the way of the story, like Morse's and Frost's do. We know Barnaby will be happy once the case is solved, so we are free to be happy as well. We don't need to get caught up in the sadness of the victim or their family. The job has been done. That was how Barnaby helped. There's nothing else he can do, so why get cut up about it? There's no need to drown his sorrows in a bottle of whiskey and ruin his liver, beginning a steady decline into type 2 diabetes. Instead, he returns to a normal home life, a lazy life in some ways. But this is Barnaby's gift to the audience. His ability as a character to leave the viewer free of undue reflections on the sadder side of life. This allows the show to become escapism for the audience, more so than the serious natured peers in other programs of the same genre. Returning to Badger's Drift now, we meet more characters, in particular the young lady Catherine Lacey, who despite having less screen time than most of the characters, is actually the centre of the story. Now that she's grown up, she is to marry her wolf, the much older Henry Trace, who is suffering from a progressive disability. Another major character is Catherine's brother Michael, La Michael Lacey, who has more screen time than his sister. He seems to be arguing with Catherine every time we see them together. He's seemingly frustrated that his beautiful young sister is marrying an elderly man who will require a considerable amount of care out of simple obligation for what Mr. Trace did for the pair's orphan young people. 
We also find out during the course of the show that the two siblings are always fought and appear to not get on well as children. Of course this knowledge brings immediate suspicion to Michael. After all, he must have an anger problem. When the Rainbirds are murdered as well, and someone, someone sees a person who looks like Michael visiting their house, we think we have our killer. Barnaby Sergeant Troy even finds a bloody knife, rather badly hidden, in Michael's studio. So this episode touches on several of the numerous ethical issues approached in the Midsummer Murders series. We suspect Michael because of circumstantial evidence, but perhaps even more so because of his past behaviour, with no real evidence that he could have been the killer, or that he is even violent. We jump to a conclusion about the murderer, but then one has to admit that is part of the fun of watching any crime mystery. Is he even the murderer? Does it though train us through habitual means to make conclusions about people based on past behaviour and circumstantial evidence? I wonder whether this is dependent on the variation of writing techniques and plot lines in the shows it watched. If the shows frequently use techniques such as the red herring we previously mentioned to put us on the wrong footing and then reveal the murderer to be someone different most of the time, then the show may in fact be teaching us that a hunch is not enough to convict that our initial emotional judgement of people is often wrong and so requires us to step back, wait and observe to make an effort not to judge a person before we really know both them and the facts. Michael does appear to be angry but the arguments that we see between him and his sister are based around Catherine marrying Henry. How would that relate to the killings of the elderly lady and the rainbirds? If Michael were going to kill someone, wouldn't it be Henry? We are pretty sure the lovers in the woods identified the elderly lady by her marking stick she left behind. We the viewers don't know who the lovers are. We didn't see them, but we jumped to the conclusion that they had something to do with her murder. The rainbirds were observers and blackmailers. The logical conclusion is that they blackmailed the wrong person, someone willing to kill to protect their secret. Could that secret be the relationship discovered by the elderly lady? So we start to move our suspicion away from Michael. Maybe it was the Doctor, a side character to the story, and a person we find out is having an affair with an unknown person. However, the affair is no secret, his wife knows, and she's busy carrying on with someone else. So it seems unlikely the Doctor has much motivation to kill to keep this secret. As viewers then, we're back to square one regarding the identity of the murderer. The killings at Badger's Drift also infers some intriguing questions outside of the criminal investigation. Such as, is Catherine in the wrong to marry a man so much wrong, older than herself? And what are her motivations? After all, is she just marrying for money and financial security? Is she marrying Henry out of obligation like Michael alludes to? How much force has Henry himself applied to make this young woman marry him? Or is Catherine genuinely in love with this man and wants to spend what little time Henry may have left of this life as close to him as possible? If the last is the case, the question is asked, is it still the right thing to do? Even if Catherine thinks she loves Henry, what if Henry doesn't die so soon and she ends up caring for him for years? Will the love she has for him last, when she has to spend so long caring for him, won't she regret the decision? Maybe she already is, and that was Catherine in the woods with a lover. Does that mean she could be the killer? Interesting, this thought is easily dismissed, much more so than our suspicion of anyone else, simply because Miss Lacey appears so gentle and mild-natured. At the end of the day, the question about motivation for the marriage is answered in the course of the episode, and I won't reveal it here in case of spoiling the story for you. The downside though of Catherine's motivation being revealed and our questions answered in the show is that it cuts short our reflections on the ethics of the matter before we arrive at the place where we start to question our own reactions or opinions to Catherine and Henry's situation. Before we stop and reflect on how our view of the world, and in fact our view of Catherine's beauty and youth, make us immediately opposed to this wedding or not. Many of us project vulnerability and almost porcelain-like fragility onto the image of the orphaned Catherine, and the last thing we want to do is to see her enthralled to an older man, who we assume will be dependent on her. Henry Trace becomes a villain in our view because he, we see him as stealing Catherine's youth from her tying her up for his own selfish ends? Or are we just jealous of his money and his beautiful fiancée? 
Let's face it, that's not a question we really want to answer. Throughout the killings at Badger's Drift, the viewer is constantly engaged in the pursuit of the killer. Barnaby solves the crime on screen with some help from his personal sergeant, who is preoccupied with the apparent but never confirmed sexuality of Dennis Rainbird. But we the viewer are constantly trying to pre-guess pre -guess the end to beat Barnaby to it, while simultaneously waiting with bated breath for Barnaby to reveal to us whether we are correct or not. If after all our ponderings we can't work it out, we allow Barnaby to reveal the real killer to us. We trust him. He's the lead character, the expert detective, the on-screen genius that we the viewers relate to. We even go so far as to rely on Barnaby to make the world right again and return the county of Midsummer to its peaceful, idyllic state. As Paul Schrader tells us, movies will always have a moral component. One can't depict real-life situations, develop characters, and tell stories over time without moral ramifications. Midsummer is no exception. From Sergeant Troy's disgust at the perceived sexuality of Dennis Rainbird, to the shock of the elderly lady in discovering the tryst in the woods, Midsummer Murders exposes us to moral judgments that surround the character's actions. In fact, the culmination of the killing of Badger's Drift is the revelation of a morally reprehensible act that not only drives the killer, but also comes close to meeting him in its moral repugnancy. An act which both characters and viewers innately see as wrong and repel themselves from as it lunges against the moral expectations and conduct codes of our society. Once we identify this act and its participants, the events related in the story become hauntingly clear. It's the most frightening part of the story, a climax we shy away from and yet also experience relief through, because it gave us an understanding of the motivation for the crime, the twisted nature of the killer, the confusion of the victims, and all at the same time. An emotional rollercoaster that somehow stays within the confines of real life. There is no fantasy in the killing at Badger's Drift. Although we may not want to admit it, everything is realistic. It's all perfectly feasible. It's real life in all its grit and grime. And that's what makes it such a relief when Barnaby returns to the comfort of his family life. We welcome his return to the company of his stereotypic wife, which in itself is a discussion for another day. So the rainbow did it. Let's face it, we don't really care. In fact, we're almost pleased because it moves the storyline forward. Besides, the Rainbirds were nasty characters anyway. They are money-grubbing, blackmailing people, feeding on other people's misfortunes. An opinion of them that is enforced psychologically by Dennis's profession as an undertaker. This raises some ethical questions. Shouldn't we care about the Rainbirds' death beyond the implications for the plot? Should we really be almost pleased at the death of unliked characters? Does anyone deserve death? And if they do, do we have the right to decide? Very Gandalf moment, that one. Also, Dennis's occupation in the story seems to highlight how certain professions are often characterised in the media. The fact that he's an undertaker colours our view of Dennis Rainbird. It makes his corruption much worse in our minds by adding to his caricature. So we see that Midsummer Murders, like a myriad of other TV shows and movies, is not immune to utilising a bit of stereotyping when it suits its own purposes. One theme that's not heavily influential in this pilot episode of Badger's Drift, but which emerges throughout Barnaby's investigations in Midsummer County, across the ensuing years is the portrayal of churches and places of worship as sombre, dark and dangerous places. The use of village churches and similar buildings in a series portraying real life is of course valid, it's important, but these shows frequently present a very different perspective than those many clergy would wish their congregation to have of the central functioning buildings and positions within parish life. The suspicious view of religion often extends beyond the portrayal of the buildings to include the congregation themselves, and sometimes even to the clergy. This is a shared characteristic between several British crime shows, but it's especially notable in shows such as Inspector Morse and Midsummer Murders, 
Both of which favour the portrayal of Catholic and High Church Anglican faith, but do not use these exclusively. As filming locations, these centres for religious life in rural and suburban England are often portrayed as places in which either horrific criminal activity occurs or as the place where that hideous criminal activity is revealed, often to a listening priest, and then it's hidden, sometimes with the unfortunate death of a person who knows more than it's safe to know. The priestly rites in administering the offices of the church are shown as a method of building suspense, and the shadowy semi lit interior of churches and cathedrals are portrayed in a sinister manner in order to build to an expected climactic shock, a shock that is by nature thrilling in the paradoxical manner of a traditional ghost story, thrilling but not a surprise, for we have been taken through a pilgrimage of on screen preparation, accompanied along the way by music which warns of impending danger and we know now to expect that someone will be found murdered within the confines of these hollowed walls. Badger's Drift features in more than just this episode and has the highest death toll of any Midsummer County village. The theme music for Midsummer Murders is played on a theremin by Celia Sheen Theremins were invented in 1919 by Russian physicist Leon Theremin and they are played by moving one's hand in the proximity of the instrument's antenna without actually touching the instrument. 